Hello again. Last time I told you a little bit about the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And the point I really wanted you to get was that the tomb wasn't a bit of luck stumbling on a tomb. Finding an intact royal tomb was a matter of hard work, knowledge, perseverance. But the truth about the last lecture is I really, I really didn't tell you much about Tutankhamun. I didn't answer the questions about who were his parents. The tomb didn't tell us that. What I want to do today in this lecture is something different from what we've been doing. I want to present an archaeological theory. It's my theory. And it's just a theory. It's not fact. But I want to show you how an Egyptologist puts together a theory. And if anything, I should say to you, this lecture could be harmful to your health. Uh, it's not certainly subscribed to by all archaeologists. Some believe I'm right. Many believe I'm wrong. But I want to show you that I think Tutankhamun was murdered. Let's go back to Achet Aten. Remember the holy city in the desert that Akhenaten had founded? And Akhenaten died after 17 years of ruling. And I didn't answer the question, well, who becomes king next? How does that happen? Akhenaten dies. As far as we know, there are only two royal people alive after Akhenaten dies. His wife, Nefertiti, died before him. He had six daughters. Five of them are dead. There are only two royal people alive at the death of Akhenaten. One is a daughter. Ankesen Patten is her name. Ankesen Patten. Something like causing the Aten to live. Ankesen Patten. The other royal person alive is an eight-year-old boy. His name is Tutank Aten. Now, I haven't mentioned him. Tutank Aten is probably, most Egyptologists agree, probably the son of Akhenaten, but his mother isn't the famous Nefertiti, the great wife. Akhenaten had two wives, and little Tutank Aten's mother is a woman named Kia. So he would be the half-brother of the little girl who's alive. There are two royal kids alive, Ankesen Paten and Tutank Aten. They are the only royal children alive. Now, think about it. The girl, her mother was Nefertiti, the great wife. Her father was the king. She has the pure royal blood through her veins. The boy is half royal. The father is the king. He is the only candidate to be the king. He's the only royal male alive. So he is married to his nine-year-old sister. They're roughly the same age. He is married to his nine-year-old half-sister and becomes king of Egypt. This almost everybody agrees on. Now, remember, they're living at this holy city in the desert. And the pharaoh who started this whole religion is dead. The religious leader is dead. What do you do? Do you go on with worshiping the Aten when your leader's dead? Or do you go back to the old religion? Now, the king, who's an eight-year-old boy, can't make this decision. There must have been discussions about what do we do? Do we move out of this place? Do we go back to Thebes? Do we do this? In the end, they gave up the new religion. They packed up. They deserted the city. They moved out of this wilderness in the desert, the city in the desert, and they moved back to the capital, Thebes. Not only did they move, but little Tutankhaten, the new king, changes his name to Tutankhamun. He's changing his name to show that it's the old religion coming back. And the girl, she changes her name to Ankesenamun. So these two children, Ankesenamun and Tutankhamun, move the religion back to Thebes. Surely they're not making the decisions. Somebody's making it for them. The best bet is the vizier, an older man named Ai, A-Y-E, and he is calling the shots, and they move back to Thebes. Okay? So imagine these two kids, eight and nine, moving back to this big city. They've never seen it. They've lived at this holy city with their father. But they're going back to Thebes. Now, back to my murder theory that Tutankhamun was killed. Let's start with the body of the victim. We have the mummy, as you know, of Tutankhamun. It was discovered in his intact tomb by Howard Carter. The mummy was in a bad state. It was very, very poorly preserved. Let me tell you why. 
At the time of burial, there was a ritual where magical oils were poured over the body. Those oils had worked over the thousands of years to destroy the body. When they finally came to the body, remember there were three coffins, one inside the other, and the body is finally inside a gold coffin. The body was stuck to the bottom, stuck to the bottom of the coffin by the oils. They tried everything to get the body out. They, they brought the coffin into the sunlight and hoped that maybe it would soften up the oil. It didn't work. Eventually, eventually, and this was never published in the official report, the mummy was sawed in half and chiseled out. That's how they got the body of Tutankhamun. So the body was in very poor condition. See, in the 1920s, nobody realized that a mummy was really a treasure. Nobody realized that it contained information. DNA hadn't been thought of. So they really weren't careful with the mummy. I mean, think about it. If, if a royal throne, if the golden throne of Tutankhamun had been stuck in oil, you think they would have sawed it in half? Never. But the mummy was not cared for well. Uh, so, it's a damaged mummy. Anyway, some things were learned. They learned for sure that the boy king had died at the age of 18 or so. There are various ways you can tell. One way is by the, when the molars erupt. That could be checked. They also can learn by the ends of the bones, called the epiphyses. As you get older, the epiphyses, the ends of your long bones, your thighs, your arms, they harden. They cease to be cartilage and they become real bone. They could tell by that Tutankhamun was about 18 years old when he died. So he was a boy king, became king when he was eight, ruled for about 10 years, and dies at the age of 18 or so. That's for sure. The objects in the tomb, of course, give us an idea of his life. You know, it's hard to reconstruct a life when the records aren't there, but it tells us a little bit. They found a chest which contained beautiful jars with the lids of Tutankhamun, a little portrait of Tutankhamun on the top, that contained his internal organs. From mummification, when his mummy was pr preserved, they took out the internal organs and put them in these little jars, little coffinets, putting them inside, preserving it, right? So you can tell. But also, there were other things inside the tomb that were real surprises. To me, the most interesting. When they started going into other rooms in the tomb, and they were small rooms, they found two little coffins, miniature coffins, about two feet high, less. No name on them, just little coffins. And when they started opening the coffins, there was another little coffin inside, beautifully, beautifully presented. Inside that was looked like a little bundle, a little mummy, inside each one of the two. And inside the two little coffins were fetuses, human fetuses, two little girls, one probably about eight months old, the other about five months old. They were probably miscarriages of Tutankhamun's young wife, Ankhesenamun. Right? So, they had tried to have children, two little girls, but they didn't live. It was a big surprise. Nobody knew anything about this. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I looked at those mummies, uh, the, the fetuses, the little fetuses. Um, they were lost for many years, and they were found at Kasser Alaini Hospital in Cairo, and I went to examine them, and it, it was rather touching looking at these little fetuses. Um, it was very sad. It was, it was a very sad thing. But anyway, we learned a little bit about Tutankhamun's life, but not enough from the tomb. But in the 1960s, there was going to be another examination of the mummy, a more scientific one. The mummy was going to be x-rayed for the first time. And x-ray equipment was brought into the tomb of Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun's mummy, a lot of people don't know this, is still inside the tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Even when, when tourists go into the tomb, you don't see the mummy. It's inside the sarcophagus. It's inside. Because his mummy was the only one ever found intact in its tomb, they decided that it ought to be left there. So Tutankhamun still rests in his tomb in the Valley of the Kings. And they didn't want to bring it out either. So x-ray machine, a portable x-ray machine, had to be brought in. And Professor Harrison, a professor of anatomy, was in charge of the x-raying. Uh, so Tutankhamun's mummy was first x-rayed in the 1960s. Now it's interesting what they learned. First of all, it confirmed he was about 18 when he died. Now, Remember I said this lecture is going to be about my theory that he was murdered. It's this autopsy that first led me to think of murder. Let me say why. I was watching a TV show, a special about Tutankhamun. And I'm not too interested in Tutankhamun at that point. I'm just kind of watching it because it's Egyptology. And they had old footage of the anatomist, Dr. Harrison 
talking about the x-ray of Tutankhamun, right? And he had an x-ray of the skull of Tutankhamun on the screen. And he said, pointing to a little kind of a spot where it looked like there was a bump or something like that, a darkened spot on the, on the x-ray, he said, and I'll quote it, it could have been caused by a hemorrhage under the membranes overlaying the brain in this region. It could have been caused by a blow to the back of the head, which in turn could have caused death. So Harrison looked at this x-ray and said, you know, it looks like he could have been killed by a blow to the back of the head. Now, Harrison wasn't sure that it was a blow to the back of the head. It's not quite clear. But what I want to stress is, he said, could have been a blow to the back of the head that may have caused his death. That's not murder. Could have fallen off a chariot. Could, anything could have happened. But it's a start. And you'll see why I come to the murder theory slowly. You know, the x-ray of Tutankhamun's skull can tell you a lot. Not just about how he died, but how he was mummified. If you look at the x-ray of the skull, at the top of the skull, you will see what looks to be a very thick bone, like, your, like the top of his head is really thick. That's not a bone. And if you look at the back of the head, you'll see the same thing. It looks like a super thick skull. That's what the x-ray revealed. That's not a bone either. It tells me exactly how Tutankhamun was mummified. At the time of mummification, the brain is removed because it will rot, it will decay. And it's removed through the nose, a piece at a time. It's a long story, I won't go into it now. But after the brain is removed, Tutankhamun is lying on a table. Imagine the corpse is spread out on a table and the head is kind of leaning, off, leaning on, on the back of the table, looking skyward, so to speak, up at the ceiling. They then poured resin, hot tree resin, through the nose into the brain case, into the cranium, to cauterize the area. So what happens is it pools at the back of the head, solidifies, and that's what the x-ray is showing us, that resin solidified at the back of the head. Then they move the head off the table so that the chin is pointing towards the ceiling. They poured more resin in, and then it goes to the lowest point, which is the top of the head now. It's hanging off the table. So by looking at the x-ray, you can say, this is how they mummified Tutankhamun. So the x-ray can show us quite a bit, quite a bit. But it's not murder. There also, by the way, in the x-ray, you can see a loose bone floating in the cranium. And some people thought, oh, maybe that's where the blow to the back of the neck came. No, that's not where he got the blow to the back of the head. That's a bone that was probably maybe, maybe lodged by the mummification people, the, the embalmers, when they were embalming him. It's, it's much after the death. We can tell it's post-mortem. Because otherwise, it would be stuck in the resin if it happened before, and then they poured in the resin. No, that's what we call in the murder mystery business a red herring. It kind of throws you off the trail. No. So the x-ray is not really why I'm saying he was murdered. No. It's what got me thinking about it. It may be a blow to the back of the head. But what really leads me to think that Tutankhamun was murdered is the circumstantial evidence. You know, the physical evidence never proves murder. Even if you find someone with a bullet in the brain, it doesn't mean he was murdered. And it's the same with a blow to the back of the head. It doesn't mean he was murdered. You always have to look at the circumstances surrounding the physical evidence. And that's when I thought about murder. Harrison, the anatomist, didn't know much about Egyptology, didn't know the circumstances under which Tutankhamun lived, you know, that these were strange times, his father was a heretic pharaoh. He didn't know that. But when I started to think about, hmm, blow to the back of the head, and then the circumstances, that's when I thought about murder. And let me present the circumstances. I think the circumstances are absolutely remarkable, unique in the history of Egyptian civilization. Tutankhamun dies suddenly at the age of 18. We know it's sudden. He's buried in a very small tomb. Very small. It was a hasty burial. They had to get things together. Only 70 days for mummification. You know, the whole ritual took 70 days. So everything put in that tomb had to be prepared within 70 days. Right? So it's a very hasty burial. He dies suddenly. He leaves a widow, Anka Sinaman, his wife, who's about 19. Now, remember, when they were married, they were the only two royal people alive. The only two. She is now the last member of the royal family. She is the last member 
of that great family going down from Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III and Amenhotep, she is the only surviving royal person. Right? What does she do? She writes a letter the likes of which no one has ever seen. She writes a letter to the Hittite king. Now, let me explain. The Hittites, they ruled the area which is modern Turkey. The Hittites are one of the traditional enemies of Egypt. They've been battling it out for a long time. These were not friendly relationships. And Anka Sinaman writes a letter to the Hittite king saying, my husband has died. I have no sons. They say that you have many sons. Send me one of your sons, and I will marry him and make him king of Egypt. Now think about that. That's like the British writing to Hitler and saying, come on over. She is writing to the Hittite king, the enemy, saying, send me a prince. I'll marry him and make him king of Egypt. Unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. And she ends her letter, I am afraid. Now she's the queen of Egypt. What is she afraid of? And aren't there eligible suitors in Egypt? Isn't there someone she can marry? Well, the letter has one more detail in it. She says, never will I marry a servant of mine. Now, a servant of mine means a commoner. It sounds like, for some reason, this 19-year-old widow is afraid. Being forced to marry a commoner? Right? Who's doing that? Anyway, the Hittite king did not believe the letter. It was so bizarre. Just couldn't believe it. He sent an ambassador to Egypt. Said, check it out, see if it's true. The ambassador came back and said, yes, it is true. Said it is true. So finally, the king sends a prince. The Hittite prince comes to Egypt. Now, we have the Hittite records of this. We don't have the Egyptian records. We have the Hittite archives. And the Hittite prince was murdered on the borders of Egypt before he entered the country. Now, that Hittite prince didn't come by himself. He came with a bodyguard, an entourage. This is a prince who's going to become king of Egypt. For him to be murdered, it isn't like a roving band, no. This had to be almost like an official government-sponsored hit. Right? The question is, who did that? Now, what happened to Anka Sinaman? Right? It's an interesting thing. The walls of Tutankhamun's tomb give us a clue. It's as close as we're ever going to get to knowing what happened. It's almost like a photograph taken 33 centuries ago. The walls of Tutankhamun tomb were hastily painted. They're not carved. You had to do it quickly, 70 days. But they show the burial of Tutankhamun. They show Tutankhamun on a sled. They didn't use wheels in ancient Egypt much because they, they, they go into the sand. Being pulled on a sled by, pa by the palace officials. There are 10 officials with white headbands on for sign of mourning. And they're pulling Tutankhamun to that tomb. But you know who's not one of those officials? the old vizier who was calling the shots, who was making the decisions, I, A-Y-E, he had been with them all the time. He's not there. If you want to find I on the tomb walls of Tutankhamun, there's another scene. There's another scene. And what it shows is Tutankhamun as a mummy. He's dressed like Osiris. He's in white. He's wrapped because he's now Tutankhamun Osiris. He's with the god of the dead. He is the god of the dead. He's going to resurrect. And I, the vizier of Egypt, the advisor to Tutankhamun, is wearing a leopard skin. And in his hand, he has an instrument. It's an odd-shaped instrument. It's called an adze. It's a, it's a, it's a woodworking tool, really. With, it's a wooden handle with a metal end. And he is taking this implement, and he is touching it to the mouth of the mummy. It's the opening of the mouth ceremony. He is giving breath to the mummy so it can speak in the next world and so it can eat in the next world and so it can say magical spells to resurrect in the next world. So I, the vizier, wearing the leopard skin, which is a sign of a high priest, he's acting as the high priest, 
is giving life to Tutankhamun. But that's not all I is wearing. If you look carefully on his head, he has the crown of the king of Egypt. I has become king of Egypt. And above his head is a cartouche with his name in it. So we know that I is the one who succeeds Tutankhamun as king of Egypt. Now, I is a commoner. How did I become king of Egypt? Now, this is a real puzzle, how did a commoner. But we know the rules, roughly, for how you become king of Egypt. And it's a good bet, a good bet, that he married Anka Sanaman. He might be the commoner that she is so afraid of being forced to marry. Right? There's a little more evidence than that for that theory, though. In the 1930s, Professor Newberry, an Egyptologist, was looking through an antiquity shop when he found a finger ring, an ancient finger ring. It was at Blanchard's shop in Cairo. And Professor Newberry, of course, as an Egyptologist, can read hieroglyphs. It had the names of two people in a double cartouche, cartouches together. I was one of them and Ankhesenamun was the other. It meant that they were married. So I became king of Egypt by marrying Ankhesenamun. Now, Newberry was really interested in this ring. He knew how important it was. And he wrote a letter to Howard Carter, who had discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, was, of course, interested in this whole thing. And he said, my dear Carter, I was in Blanchard's, and I found this finger ring, blue faience finger ring, and it has the cartouches of I and Ankhesenamun. It can only mean they were married. It says, have you been lately to the tomb of I in the Western Valley? Is Ankhesenamun present there? See, everybody wondered what happened to Ankhesenamun after she's afraid and marries I. The answer, I'll tell you the answer. She disappears from history. The last thing we hear about her is this finger ring that says they were both married. She writes to the Hittite king, says, I'm afraid, send me a prince. The prince is murdered. Ankhesenamun disappears, and I is king of Egypt. Now, it's, it's, it's like a murder mystery, but it's almost better. The ring that Professor Newberry found, he didn't have the money to buy it. He copied it, right? And when he wrote to Carter, he had a little drawing of it. But he didn't have the money to buy it. And I guess somebody else bought it, and nobody's ever seen that ring. So after a while, people wondered, did the Newberry ring really exist? Did it really exist? I remember a friend of mine, Jeffrey Martin, saying, well, nobody's ever seen the Newberry ring. But quite recently, you know, within our modern times, within the last 20 years, a ring appeared for sale on the antiquities market. It's not the same as Newberry's. It's a different color, but it's very similar. And indeed, it has the cartouches of Anka Sinaman and I. They were indeed married. As a matter of fact, it's in the Berlin Museum now. Uh, I went to Berlin to see it. I wanted to see this ring. And funny thing happened to me in the Berlin Museum when I, when I asked to see the ring. I called up the curator to ask. Now remember, there used to be an East and West Berlin. And there were separate Egyptian collections, East and West. And now they're joined together. And I called up and I got a curator. And I said, you know, I, I'd like to really see the finger ring that has I and Anka Sanam's name on it. And the curator, a wonderful woman, Dr. Kishkiewicz, she, she said to me, we don't have a ring like that. I said, oh my God, maybe the ring doesn't exist. I said, wait, I know, people have talked about it. They've published articles about it. She said, no, I don't think we have such a ring. And I said, wait, is Dr. Vildung there, who is the curator of the other side of Berlin? And he said, yes, he just walked in. I said, you know, Dr. Vildung, don't you have this ring? He said, yes, of course we have it. She was from the other side of Berlin that didn't know about this part of the collection, but the ring existed, and I had it in my hands in a couple of days. Um, there's no question about it. The ring exists. I, indeed, did marry Anka Sinaman. But what happened to Anka Sinaman? Remember, Newberry writes and says, can you go out to, 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 to I's tomb? It's in the West Valley of the Kings. And look to see if in the cartouche there might be room for Ankhesenamun's name. Now, think about what Newberry's thinking. I eventually died, had a tomb, and in his tomb would be a picture of his queen. Now, his queen should be Ankhesenamun. That's how he became king of Egypt, by marrying her. So I went. We have no record of whether Carter went back and answered Newberry. But I went to the valley 
to look at I's tomb. And let me say this. Ankasanaman is a long name. You know, you can just sound it. Even in hieroglyphs, it's fairly long. Ankasanaman. When I looked in I's tomb, the first thing that you notice is every trace of I and his wife as queen have been erased. He's been chiseled out, cut out of the wall for some reason. But there's enough of the hieroglyphs left that you can tell where the queen's name should have gone. Just above one of the cartouches it says, Hemet Weret, which means the great wife. That's the queen. And that cartouche is very short. Now, when I was at Amarna with Akhenaten, he had a wife, Queen T. Not Queen T, just T. Same as Queen T, the same name, but his name was T. That's a short name. That's the name that was in that cartouche that's been erased. It's a short, short name. Anka Sanaman doesn't appear anywhere. Anywhere. She's not even on the tomb in Tutankhamun, on his walls. And I'll tell you why she doesn't appear on Tutankhamun's walls, because I intended to marry her. He wasn't going to put her on the walls for eternity of Tutankhamun. No. No. It looks like, and this is my theory, Tutankhamun is murdered. Why? Maybe I, the vizier, wanted to take over as king. They're about the age, these two young people, Tutankhamun and Akhenaten, where they can have children. They've had fetuses, two miscarriages. If the next one's a boy, that's going to be king of Egypt. So maybe I wanted to be king. Just maybe. Didn't like this teenager taking over, really running the country. It's possible. But think of it this way. Why is Akhenaten writing that letter saying, I'm afraid? And there's no question about it. The Hittite prince is a murder. That's for sure. There's one murder for sure, and it took official power to kill a Hittite prince coming with an entourage. I would have had to be involved in it. And then Anka Sanaman disappears mysteriously. Right? I think that a reasonable explanation is that I murders Tutankhamun. She knows this, perhaps, is afraid. He is then forcing her to marry him. The only thing this poor young woman can think of doing is writing to the most powerful people she can think of outside of Egypt, because Egypt, in a sense, is doing her in. I is the one who's pushing her. So she writes to the Hittites, rather naively, thinking, oh, they'll come and save me. They don't believe her, but eventually they're convinced. They see something's going on. Prince is sent. I marry. I has the prince murdered. Marries Anka Sanaman. And we don't know what happens to Anka Sanaman. She disappears. We don't have a tomb for her. We have no idea where she was buried. We just don't know what happened. As I said in the beginning, this is just a theory. Right? You shouldn't take it as fact. I think it's a reasonable theory. Not because of the x-ray. That suggests a blow to the back of the head, that's all. But the circumstances of the letter writing, the prince being killed, all of that, I think, suggests that Tutankhamun was murdered. Now, the story doesn't end here. I ruled for only another three years or so and dies. We know that his tomb is desecrated. Right? We know that his tomb is desecrated. But there's further research that can be done. There is. The mummy of Tutankhamun still rests in the tomb. Not only the mummy, but in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo are his internal organs. Stomach, liver, intestines, kidneys. If I can get access to that, and I'm, I'm going to be requesting permission to do a third autopsy on the mummy of Tutankhamun, we might be able to really find out how he died. For example, we can examine the stomach contents. We can look and see if he had a meal before he died. Or maybe if he was sick, the stomach would be empty if he hadn't eaten for a while. We can tell if he lingered. If he had, you know, we can look for diseases even. We can do tests for diseases. So, and we can do a better, better than x-ray, we can do CAT scans now. And we can really look at that skull and see, is there really a blow to the back of the head? So my hope is that in the near future, we'll have more data on the murder of Tutankhamun. But what I like to think, what I like to think, is that there's a little bit of justice in the world. There's an ancient saying that says, to say the name of the dead is to make him live again. And if that's true, I's name has all been forgotten, all but been forgotten.
The only reason we know I is because of his association with Tutankhamun. And the one whose name is always said again and lives again is Tutankhamun. Next time, we'll talk about what happens after the death of Tutankhamun. I'll see you then.